Welcome to content check number three, Miss Duncan, the Renaissance unit, uh, unit one. Um, I need to go back really quickly here up to a uh, previous slide, slide 14 in your notes, where it talks about, we did all this in class, where it talks about life in the Middle Ages, the 14th and 15th century, because for some reason this wasn't in content check number one. So. The uh, life of Middle Ages, you really want to focus on how things change socially uh, between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And so uh, we see uh, marriage and family um, during the Middle Ages is going to be 16 to 18 years for women uh, and, of course, later for men. We talked about this actually in class, uh, that whole idea that, hey, you don't want to bring your wife home to your mama. Um, you know, hey, baby, let's go home to my mama's house is not what you want your husband to hear or to say on your wedding night, not what you want to hear. So um, men are going to marry later simply because they've got to uh, build up a little bit more money and be able to support a family so they can have that nuclear family that was central to the Middle Ages life uh, and have their own place to go and live. In your fill-in-the-blank notes, you do have a line there for the oldest profession, a.k.a. prostitution. Um, prostitution was a perfectly acceptable and pretty uh, regular thing that you would see during this time period. Uh, marriage is usually governed by economic factors. There's not a whole lot of marrying for love in this time period, even uh, in the lower classes. You've got uh, folks, especially in the upper classes, it's purely for economic and political gain um, or to exchange land. Maybe you've got uh, somebody who's down on their luck and they're about ready to lose everything, so they've got to go and marry somebody rich. Uh, but it's mostly for economic factors. Uh, divorce is n not something that's going to be happening. You've got to get special permission from the Pope in order to get divorced, um, and the Catholic religion does not condone divorce, so divorce is fairly non-existent. Um, church regula regulations are usually not going to be followed. So uh, again, we've got this time of being uh, of needing some cleanup. Even though this is the time of faith, uh, the era of faith, we've still got some areas that need a little bit of uh, a little bit of tweaking. Life in the parish. Paris is just another word for church. Life amongst the church. Um, there was a term in your vocabulary, a layperson, or the laity. Increased lay management of the church arises um, because of the church being in crisis. So you've got a priest. You've got um, those folks. Those are actual, you know, members of the church, uh, and people who are involved and attached to the church. A lay person is someone who helps run the church but isn't um, a member of the actual church, uh, like a, a technical official position, like a priest or a monk or um, everything up from priest when you get into bishop, cardinal, etc. So all those folks are members of the church and actually employed or uh, a part of the church. They've said vows. Uh, lay people or the laity are the folks who are, uh, and again, they're still Christians, they're still Catholic, but they're, they haven't taken any vows to the church, um, such as taking vows like a priest would do. Uh, it is, of course, the center of life for the Middle Ages, the church is. We see an increase in guilds, so double check your vocabulary term on a guild on a guild, those specialized um, skilled laborers where you have to be trained, you're an apprentice, um, and of course they actually benefit from the plague because with their special skill set they're the only ones that can perform the labor or the task that someone might need and then they get to pick and choose the people that they want uh, so you've got really skilled labor um, evolving during this time period and widespread dunk drunkenness and violence that doesn't take much explanation uh, but the bull baiting and bear baiting sports these are going to be pretty bloody sports um, where it's exactly what you would sound. You make a bull or a bear mad, uh, then you go out there and somebody's going to die. Uh, sometimes it's the people, sometimes it's the animals, but a very bloody sport. Uh, and of course the execution of William Wallace. If you've had a chance to watch Braveheart, this is the Middle Ages, this is this time period. Um, it is a very uh, savage type of time period uh, where it's, you know, take care of yourself, be able to fight, take care of your family, uh, and go on from there. 
So we'll go ahead and go on to content, the actual content check three now. Okay, so content check three. These are the things that you want to pay particular attention to. Make sure you can define vernacular. Um, how does it fit in with the humanism movement? Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of books and writings in this uh, section, this time period. And then what is the political setup and what is an Italian city-state? And Mr. Stipp does a great job with his humanism videos as well. So kind of a second, hand, a second source so that you can kind of see uh, how all these things overlap and how they work uh, during the Renaissance. And then finally we need to finish up by finding out why does Italy become the center of the Renaissance? Why does the Renaissance begin in Italy? So starting off, we've got a comparison of literature in the Middle Ages versus the comparison uh, or versus the Middle Ages, or excuse me, I'll get this right in one moment, Blah. the Middle Ages uh, literature versus the Renaissance literature. So in the Middle Ages, you're going to have um, mainly theology books. Uh, theology, of course, from your Quizlet vocabulary section is the study of religion. Uh, so you've got uh, that sort of, that kind of book. So again, centering around a religion. That should not be a shocker to you that the books and the um, literature centers around religion. Law, history, or dominant themes, mostly written in Latin. Again, nothing that should be shocking you here. And then legendary themes like the feats of knights and chivalry. So if you were getting outside of law or history, then the only other kind of books you're going to have are heroes such as knights and nobles and um, you know how you're supposed to act and and, uh, again, getting back to that feudal system that they kind of shrug off whenever they go into um, into the Renaissance because of that whole Hundred Years' War thing. So we've got um, those type of books that are prevalent during the Middle Ages. So whenever you look over at, uh, whenever we get into talking about Cervantes uh, and the book Don Quixote uh, and how they kind of... Uh, make fun of feudalism and knights. Again, that should not be too much of a shocker to you because the Renaissance was all about moving away from those times. They they look they um, looked down their nose at the Middle Ages and thought they were so much better than the Middle Ages. So we're going to see a lot of that. Uh, with the Renaissance, those first modern writers, lots and lots of humanists, that's why it's such an important question on your study guide and why uh, Mr. Stipp in his videos goes through all those different humanists and why we met a lot of humanist writers in our Renaissance people activity in class. They're going to write in the vernacular. Again, this is your common language uh, and it's derived from the word vulgar. If you're a low common person, you speak vulgar language. Now today, when we say vulgar language, we're talking swear words because that's really kind of the bottom of the barrel, supposedly the lowest of the low kind of language. Only unintelligent people use that kind of language. Well, vernacular comes from this idea of vulgar language, the vulgar, the vulgate. And so it's having your own actual language that's spoken by the common people in an area. So for Italy, it's going to be Italian. Rather than speaking in the more educated uh, languages of Latin, Greek, uh, and then eventually it's also going to turn over to French. Um, sonnets and biographies are also going to be written during this time. Sonnets, again, think of that human uh, humanism idea that one, you know, there's two characteristics of humanism, attention to detail in human anatomy, but the other characteristic is, again, living life to its fullest. So we're going to turn away from religious pursuits or even possibly, uh, you know, the law and and showing how um, heroic the knights were. And now we're going to finally get some writing that's more about everyday life and just personifying um, the individual and uh, taking care, or not taking care of, but uh, showing the beauty in life. So we've got secular tales. Uh, we also have some political and social themes. This should not shock you either since all the time I'm talking about how's that political and how's that social. So they're going to take a look at social classes. They're going to take a look at politics and they're really going to kind of dive into these ideas uh, to get an idea of what's going on around them because this time period and Renaissance is also about inquiry and figuring out what's going on since they can't look to the church anymore for answers they have to look outside the church and so we're going to be seeing them getting into more um, themes and ideas than what they did during the Middle Ages. 
a Renaissance man or woman, uh, and this is actually, there's a nice little insert in your book that talks about the Vir 2. Um, take a look at the, we'll start with the male side first, charming, witty. Um, if you'll skip down to talented in warfare, like riding and wrestling and fencing. So we go from the more savage pursuits to more high uppity type of warfare skills. They're also more talented in the arts, um, and they're collectively called Vir 2. Okay, Veer 2, um, which has, of course, this stem of man. Uh, the root word has something to do with men and be, and it looks like virtuous for a reason. Because essentially, the Renaissance man is just another way of saying well-rounded person. So when you're taking lots of college classes or you're in um, multiple sports and you're in lots of clubs, this is in that whole, you're hopefully that's because you have lots of interests and you're, you're trying to become a well-rounded person. Um, some of you may just be padding your resume for colleges, who knows, but that's because colleges are looking for that well-roundedness. So whether it is a, an effort to become a better, more whole person, or because you want to get into college, one way or the other, it's this whole idea of being a well-rounded person. That's essentially all a Renaissance man or woman is. So hey, you're a Renaissance man or woman and you didn't even know it. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is kind of like the example for being a well-rounded man because his resume is just stacked with things. He isn't just a painter. Um, he's an engineer. He's an architect. He's a writer. The list is just miles and miles long. This man did a little bit of everything. Um, when we look at the women uh, they wouldn't necessarily be um, as well educated. Um, they would have general education with the classics, uh, but there's no reason to need to um, teach them how to speak or learn rhetoric because they're not going to go and try and influence poli other people, other politicians, make laws, that sort of thing. Uh, but again, there is the idea of hey, you should be charming, you should have some sort of education. Um, but whenever we're talking about this, it is going to be mostly higher class women. And I do want to make that very clear because this is where some confusion arises with women. Um, take a look at your women index, um, AP uh, women in AP Euro. Um, when we're talking about women being educated, it's mostly going to be the upper class, the nobility. Very few women are actually going to be educated at this time. Uh, most women, of course, are going to just be um, in, uneducated. There's not going to be a need to really um, give them any sort of education. So while you know we talk about how some e women are educated, I don't want to give you the misconception or the uh, or give you the perception that all women now are going to be educated because they're not. It's really just going to be a small select group in the upper class. Vernacular literature. Um, there are two examples of vernacular literature that kind of make their way onto the scene in the 1300s and um, that we're going to talk about both of them. One's in Italy, one's in England. So uh, that transformation over from the Middle Ages into the Renaissance. The first one is The Divine Comedy by a guy named Dante Alighieri. Um, it is a book about a pilgrimage uh, through hell, purgatory, and paradise. So to do a quick vocabulary check, purgatory is kind of that in-between space between hell and heaven. You're not really, um, you're not going to hell, but you're not really um, absolved of all your sins enough to go into heaven, so you kind of have to spend a little bit of time in the waiting room, if you will. It's kind of a common euphemism used for purgatory. Um, you know, they kind of make you wait since you aren't perfectly spotless or spotless enough to get into heaven. Um, and so Dante Alighieri, um, his beloved dies and he's on his way trying to find her. And he uh, journeys through um, these different levels of hell. So if you've ever heard somebody talk about, I've entered the fourth level of hell or the tenth level of hell or the seventh level of hell or uh, anything like that, they're, they're basically um, referencing back to this book because uh, Dante goes in, uh, he's going through hell, uh, and he's kind of making his journey through all of these different things and describing it along the way. 
What the book does is it serves as a criticism for church authority. When he's walking through hell, he sees a cardinal and a former pope. So, again, acknowledging that there are some problems with the Catholic Church. And it just kind of helped uh, stress or at least give proof of the tension that existed between the church and the people at that time. Dante Alighieri is Italian, so the Divine Comedy is written in Italian. Canterbury Tales. This is uh, in England, so this book is written in English. Um, and uh, it's written during the uh, time of the Black Death, and actually that serves as a, a little bit of a side character in the book, because um, they're actually staying just a little bit ahead of the Black Death, and various times throughout the book they'll hear of people coming in and joining this group, uh, the group that is making a pilgrimage to uh, Canterbury Cathedral, and they'll be talking basically uh, and giving allusions to uh, the plague and the Black Death. Um, this is just uh, the setup for this is some folks are on their way to go to Canterbury. There is a shrine at Canterbury uh, Cathedral that everybody wants to go and kind of um, pay to go in and see and have just a little bit more blessing in their life. And so along the way, they all take turns telling stories. And so this gets really back to that humanism idea of the individual and what's going on in people's everyday lives as they take a look at um, materialistic and worldly views in these stories. Um, they're also quite racy. A few of the Canterbury Tales make it into our English books. That's where I was first introduced to them. Um, but if you've got a good, decent teacher, uh, they'll tell you that a lot of the ones in there, if you take the time to read um, in this, uh, I don't know if necessarily Old English or Middle English or it's really Old English to us, um, if you take the time to actually decipher this English, uh, then you actually start to figure out that some of them are quite racy. Uh, so if you're uh, ever in the mood to go and decipher a text so you can read something racy, then hey, pick up the Canterbury Tales um, at your local bookstores. But um, they are, of course, an early example of language and uh, tales in the vernacular. Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, and that's not a typographical er er error, it's Geoffrey with a G. Uh, and here is another picture. Hopefully you can take a look at this and pick out the uh, Gothic um, architecture t and specific techniques of the Middle Ages. And that means you have another example that you could use uh, on your um, test or study guide of the individual types of Gothic architecture. Erasmus is going to be an important person, especially when we get into Unit 2, because he's a new type of humanist called a Christian humanist. Uh, down in Italy, in the Italian Renaissance area, we have civic humanists, folks who are concentrated on doing your civic duty, your political duty, where um, up in the north, they're focused more on, um, Christ on Christianity and having a deeper spiritual connection. Um, so if you take a look here, he's from Holland, he believes in Christianity of the heart and not rituals and rules. So we get into these people up in the north that start to think, you know what, Christianity in, and my religion, my faith should be about a deeper connection with God. Uh, instead of being more ritualistic. So, for example, um, you know, the Catholic Church is very full of rituals. Um, it's time to pray now. I get down on my knees now. I say this now. I do this now. Um, when the priest says this, I say this. Um, it's time to get back down on my knees. It's time for communion. This is what I do. And so everything is a ritual, which kind of makes sense, considering the whole thing is in Latin. And a lot of people don't understand Latin. So they become very comfortable with what they're supposed to do at certain parts of the ceremony. Okay. Um, and so that ritualistic, this is what I do now because this is just what I've always done, kind of idea doesn't really sit well with our northern humanists. So they want a more spiritual, deeper connection, a Christianity of the heart, not just following the rules, really understanding that connection um, with their Christian God. Um, he wrote a book called The Praise of Folly. Now, time out for a break cake here. Sometimes it's in praise of folly. Sometimes it's three pra the praise of folly. I've seen it praise in folly. So don't get 
kind of you know really caught up in what is this thing really called so the praise of folly uh, is basically where he's poking fun at the priests some of the merchants the scholars the heart sit lovers uh, because he believe you know they're doing things that just aren't just don't really kind of make sense why are we doing these things? Um, he believes all people should study the Bible. He's actually going to translate that New Testament um, so that other people can read it. He actually translates it from the ancient Greek into Latin and into other languages so that they can we can understand. We can understand what it actually says. Um, and he always proclaims, and this is actually an important piece, uh, that, and I'll read the part that's cut off down there at the bottom, it all, he always says that he was not directly attacking the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. He's not directly attacking it. He's not trying to um, criticize it directly so that we can split off from the church or completely change the ways. He's just, you know, trying to point out your flaws so that maybe you could make some change, you know, make some internal changes and maybe try to be better. Uh, and it's more of like, I'm just questioning things. The reason why this is so important is when we get into Unit 2, we're going to see another guy who starts off just questioning things and then completely takes off, splits off from the Catholic Church, and comes up with a new type of um, different Christian religions uh, that leads to the different Christian religions that, you know, now we've got tons of types of Christianity, not just Roman Catholic. So it's very important, especially with this guy, that I point that out because he's going to be a major um, key player in our Unit 2. Now changing gears a little bit, the city-states of Italy, the city-states of Italy. Notice I have stopped and put these into political, economic, and social. So take a moment, make sure you pause the screen and look through these and get a good idea. And hopefully some of the questions that you have as you read through, I will talk about in the video. All right, hopefully you've had a chance to pause the screen. So. Politically, um, the Italian city-states are just what that sounds like. It is a city that basically is kind of like its own little country, its own state, meaning political organization, political boundaries and political entity. We have nation-states. We talked about that with nationalism, how all those little independent little counties kind of came together and became England, or the individual territories came together and became France. Well, in Italy, we aren't going to see Italy combine like the way we know it until the 1800s. So right now, it's made up of a bunch of little city-states. And essentially, inside those cities, the most um, politically um, active, the most politi the um, richest families are going to be the ones with the most power. That's how we get the Medicis being so powerful in Rome or in Florence. So an oligarchy is uh, similar to a monarchy. Monarchy, mono means one, so um, one ruler is a monarchy. Those are your kings. Oligarchies are going to be a few people ruling, um, you know, two to five people. So little in, little families like the Medicis, all of them would, you know, get onto a board um, or a council in a city and they would all just rule everything. So it might be a small family ruling uh, with, of course, the patriarch making most of the decisions. But this is how, uh, you know, these Italian city-states are kind of operating. Uh, cannot stress enough their geographic location. We already know that they were trading with uh, the Asian states because uh, they're right out there on the Mediterranean. They're right there by Asia. Um, they're getting all that trade uh, over from the Byzantine Empire, from the Ottomans, from the other areas, the end of the Silk Road. So that, of course, is going to enable them to um, have lots of exchange between East and West, and so they're going to exchange not only goods and services, but also ideas. Um, develop a b development of banking in the 14th century. Uh, this is again where the Medicis are going to make their their gains. That they're going to get all this money uh, that's going to allow them to become strong patrons of the arts, strong people who fund the arts. Um, socially, again, merchant capitalism is going to be what kind of takes away from the nobility. There were nobles in Italy before all of this was happening, but they aren't going to be as powerful because they aren't going to have as much money. Um, because there are these little itty independent operating states, they can't quite seem to keep their, solidify their power structure. So these families are just going to start taking over. Um, 
and Mr. Stipp does a good job talking about how the merchants become the middleman between the rest of Europe and uh, the uh, trade that they're making with Asia and the other parts of the world. So exotic things are going to be coming in through Italy, and they're going to be able to mark that those exotic things up quite a bit um, and really make a profit. So why Italy? Uh, Italy had many cities. There were places where, uh, so again, you've got a lot of ideas, technology, um, lots of things are going to be exchanged, not only because of trade, but or not only trade and things, but lots of other ideas. Strong merchant class. We talked about patrons of the arts. Make sure you understand that a patron of the art is someone who pays for art. They are patronizing the artists. Now, when we say patronizing today, um, you know, maybe you think your parents are patronizing to you, or your teachers are patronizing you, and you're like, "Don't patronize me. I got this." Uh, you know, when they're kind of talking to you like um, you don't know everything, you don't know anything, you're acting like a small child or someone who's ignorant. Um, and that really, that is, of course, still a word, but when we use it in this context, we're talking about people who are funding the arts. They're patronizing the arts. You patronize a store, okay, every time you go in and you purchase things. Um, so this whole patroning, patron of the arts deal is just essentially paying for art. Um, it's not like today where artists you know, sit around, make art, they put a collection out in a gallery and maybe you buy it, maybe you don't. If an artist wanted to actually create anything, then they were dependent on someone giving them the supplies, giving them a place to live, food to eat, maybe a small stipend for doing the work. Uh, and so until they had someone to patronize them, a patron, they really weren't making a whole lot of art. They were just kind of wandering around aimlessly, hoping to find someone who could provide for them. So they really hit the jackpot whenever they stumble into Florence and the Medici starting with Cosimo, but then really, really, really um, getting into things with Lorenzo um, when they found these patrons of the arts. And Florence is going to start schools for artists. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of art going on in Florence and in Italy, but especially Florence at this time, because they had wealthy people who were willing to shell out money so they could get some art. Let me see. Not to mention, it also helps that last bullet point down there that they were inspired by what was around them, um, really inspired by the past. And remember, they're going back to ancient Greece and Rome. Uh, and so sitting there living amongst these ruins uh, was something that they could really feed off of. Make sure you're familiar with kind of the different areas of Italy and the different... Um, the different city-states, Florence, uh, Milan, Venice, the papal states, papal meaning anything to do with the pope, papacy, papal, pope, uh, and then the kingdom of Naples. Uh, you've also got Venice in there. Um, I, t I will be very honest with you on these major cities. I focus a lot on Florence uh, because I love the Medicis. I love to talk about the art. But there is, of course, the other couple of cities, Venice, Genoa, big, huge banking cities and shipbuilding cities because they're over on the other side. They're on the east coast. Um, trade leaked to Constantinople over there in Turkey, which, of course, becomes Istanbul uh, when the Ottoman Turks... Um, conquer the lands and Asian land routes and Rome is always going to be important because of the Pope and the Vatican. Uh, make sure you know what a tithe is. T-I-T-H-E-S vocab check. A tithe. Um, especially when we get into Unit 2. So, go ahead and make sure that you can answer all these. You've got a good idea of what's going on. Uh, again, it might be helpful to come back after Mr. Stipp's video and just kind of look at him and see how your ideas on these things change because he does a very good job of explaining a lot of these things as well.